Thank you so much. Uh, I've been to uh, the town hall before and it, it's just always such a great experience. I, I wonder that any community who knew about the town hall wouldn't set as one of its first tasks, how, how can we make one of these for our, our community? And, and uh, I'm really excited to see some former Ithaca neighbors uh, here tonight. They said, uh, it'll be a great audience. You, you, you'll, you'll meet a lot of our friends. Uh, he described you as chronologically mature. I've got a couple of audience uh, uh, examples that will be especially meaningful, I think, uh, to, to people of my age. Uh, and the, the book is something I'm very excited to start talking about. Uh, it, it's a book about social contagion. Uh, that was the original title. Uh, I'll just say a little bit about the basic idea of the book before getting into the, the details of it. Uh, the psychologists have a saying uh, that they repeat to students over and again. They say it's the situation, not the person. What they mean by that is that when we see somebody do something and we try to uh, think about, well, why did she do that? We tend to think about traits of character, or personality, what kind of a person would do such a thing. The psychologists say, no, that's the wrong way to, to be thinking about this. Uh, people do what they do primarily because of the social circumstances that surround them. There, there are people and forces around them that, that have a very strong influence on what they do. That's not a controversial claim, although I think people tend to underappreciate the importance of the, the social environment as an influence on their own behavior. Uh, the, the thing that's less widely noticed, however, is that the causation runs also in the other direction. So if you think about the social environment, what is it a consequence of? It's a consequence of our own choices in the aggregate. So if uh, smoking uh, is the issue, uh, and we, we know from, from data that the more smokers there are out there in the environment, the more likely any given person is to take up smoking. Uh, well, what's the environment? It's the, the sum total of all the people who decided to smoke. Uh, and yet nobody really thinks uh, about that component of it. If I'm thinking about becoming a smoker, it would be very unusual to think to myself, oh, I, maybe I shouldn't do that. I'll make other people more likely to smoke. Uh, it's such a small <laughs> effect, we, we don't go there. But since the social environment has a powerful influence on us, it would be better if we did think about how what we do affects it. And what's astonishing to me is that policymakers have not given any serious thought at all about whether it would be practical to get people to do that. And it turns out that there are lots of easy levers that we could pull that would get people to act as if they cared about the social environment, uh, which is a great thing if we could do that because the social environment feeds back onto what we do, both for good and ill, and we can encourage behaviors that would make good social environments, discourage others that would make bad social environments without violating anybody's fundamental freedoms or stepping on any toes uh, or, or doing anything at all like that that we ought not to do. So why don't we think about doing that? That's, that's the question I want you to keep in the back of your mind. I, I didn't want to have peer pressure appear anywhere in the title of the book or in the marketing materials because it has such a negative valence. Oh, you shouldn't be uh, influenced by your peers. Make up your own mind what to do. It, it, it has a very clear negative connotation in, in uh, our language and culture. But then uh, my editor suggested to me, why don't we uh, have the subtitle be putting peer pressure to work? And Immediately, I thought, yeah, that's got a, a kind of a, a man bites dog feel to it. You know, uh, <laughs> peer pressure, that's a bad, put it, how would you put a bad thing to work? The fact is, you can put it to work, and I think it's a great subtitle. I'm glad that they suggested it to me and that it made its way onto the book. Uh, I wanted to start by showing you the most vivid example I could think of, of how peer pressure influences us to behave. And there's one... Uh, among all the examples that I've encountered studying this that stands out uh, ab above all others sharply uh, in, in my way of thinking about this, and uh, this is a reference that will appeal 
to the people my age in the audience. Uh, the Alan Funt uh, show I used to watch, Reli Religiously Candid Camera, he made some feature films also. One of them was called, What Do You Say to a Naked Lady? Uh, it was one they couldn't show on television. One episode in it uh, uh, was especially uh, relevant for the point I'm trying to make. He announced a, a really attractive job in a, uh, a job listing newspaper ad. It paid very well. It didn't have very many demanding requirements. Uh, the hours were short. There were opportunities for travel. Wow, how could there be such a great job as that? Uh, people would wonder when they saw the ad. And so people called and they wanted to interview for the job. And he would book appointments with people to come to interview. And when they arrived, uh, they would be ushered into a room where there would be four other people already seated waiting. Uh, those four, we, the viewer, know are confederates of Alan Funt. They're working with him. The subject doesn't know that. He goes in, he sits down, uh, and then the film continues with various other vignettes. It keeps coming back. The men are sitting there waiting. Nothing's happening. Finally, they come back to the men in the room, and the four, the confederates, stand up at no apparent signal. There has been nobody that announced to anyone to do anything, they stand up and they start taking off all their clothing. <laughs> and, and the subject is bemused, what's going on here? He's looking back and forth, he can't believe what he's witnessing, but then you can see uh, a point comes, he tips uh, and he almost shrugs and stands up and starts <laughs> taking off all, his, all of his own clothing and the scene ends, they're all standing there naked waiting for what comes next. <laughs> and and, and you, you see this scene, uh, I did, I, there's no way I would have done that, I say. Uh, but then think about it from the point of view of the subject. He's probably not got a, a very good job, that's why he came to interview for this unusually good job. Uh, he doesn't know what the process involves, but uh, he knows that if anybody knows, it might be one of the four or all, all four of the ones who are already seated there. They seem to know it's time to get up and taking, start taking off your clothes and they think it's worth doing that for a chance at this job. What, who am I to say that it wouldn't be worth it? To, so I do it too. So I think you, the idea that it's, that it's a negative trait of human nature to be influenced by what other people do, I think... Uh, if, if you think about that, that's basically wrong-headed. You want to be careful. You don't want to follow the, the dumb people doing s silly things, and we all teach our kids that. But the world is a very complicated place. We don't know anything uh, near as much as we would need to, kn to know in order to be sure of what to do in each situation. Nobody else knows either, but together, people have more information than I alone do. And so when people out there are doing something and seem to know what they're doing, that's a signal for me to react to. It's, it's a very powerful, uh, hardwired influence in our, our system, and I, I think we, we can't really, uh, <laughs> we, we can't really imagine being able to cope effectively with what we have to cope with in the world if, if we didn't have that impulse to, to mimic others. I don't know if any of you have read David Wallace Wells' book. I, I very strongly recommend it. I've been writing uh, newspaper columns about various issues related to climate change for more than a, a decade, and I'd always thought of myself as a, 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 a climate pessimist. Things are, are pretty bad. I, I had no idea until I re I'd read many of the studies he cites in the book. I had no idea until I read the book how bad things actually are. Uh, the first sentence in the book is, it is worse, much worse than you think. And by the time you're two or three chapters in, you're, you're absolutely on board with that claim. It, it, and, and I think events since this book was published have, have borne him out. Uh, the news, every, every piece of news we get is, is worse than the news before. People were busily denying that there was anything going on for a long time, but, but we don't see much of that anymore. Look at, look at the, the actual data. The, the temperature curve has been 
moving very steadily upward. Of course, there are ups and downs, but look at the slope in the very last part. You know, it's all, almost, almost straight up uh, in the air. The carbon concentration is in, in increasing year by year. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's showing up in tangible ways now. This is Ellicott City, Maryland. In 2016, they had a thousand year flood. You know what that is, it's a flood that shouldn't occur any more often than 1,000 years. Then in 2018, they had another 1,000-year flood. That's not supposed to happen uh, after two years. Uh, and we're seeing this all around the globe. We're seeing droughts of unprecedented frequency and duration. We're seeing wildfires uh, of, uh, that are covering more area and more intense uh, burning than we've ever seen in the past. This was the 2018 autumn fire in California, the, the biggest one on record until then. Uh, but now, of course, the Australian fires have completely dwarfed it. Uh, they have emitted nine times the amount of CO2 into the air as the California wildfires. It, things are bad. Things are very bad. We can do something about that. We have all the tools we need to do something about that. And I think if we understand a little bit more clearly what the causes of the problem are and what the possible solutions might look like, we would be prepared to move forward with surer footing than we seem to be now. The, I think the public now is aware that things are bad. What, what seems missing, in, in my mind, in the climate conversation is a plausible narr narrative about how we go forward from here. Some, something that make, makes people say, yeah, we could do that. Uh, and, and, and that's where I think the behavioral contagion ideas uh, have something useful to offer. So let me get, backtrack now and say a little bit more about the process itself of contagion. So when, when I was 14 uh, in 1959, I started smoking. Most of my friends, uh, the ones I was closest to at any rate, had already been smoking for a couple of years uh, then. Uh, my parents were both smokers. They didn't want me to smoke, but you know, what, what would it mean to say, don't smoke when you're smoking yourself? It's, a, it's not a persuasive admonition coming from a smoker. I smoked. It was the natural thing to do un under the circumstances. Uh, I count myself lucky to have quit a couple of years later, uh, most people who start smoking don't quit, at least not without uh, a, a multi-year uh, series of painful efforts to do that. Uh, and the reason people smoke uh, is, is, is really quite social. This is one of the most uh, clear examples of social influence. I have four adult sons. Not one of them is a smoker. I was telling a friend, if they had grown up when I did, at least two of them would be smokers, I thought. One of my sons was present during this conversation and immediately asked, which two? Uh, <laughs> and I said, David would be a smoker, I was almost sure, and probably Hayden. The middle two, I wasn't sure. Jason, uh, son number two, he wouldn't have smoked no matter when he'd been born. Uh, Chris, I'd, it was Chris who asked which two. He said, you don't think I would have been a smoker if I'd grown up with it? He seemed offended that I didn't think he would have been a smoker. <laughs> but the reason they didn't become smokers was that when I became a smoker, the smoking rate was three times what it is uh, when they, they were growing up thinking about whether to, to become a smoker. Their friends didn't smoke. That's why they didn't become a smoker. And for me, I count that as a very valuable Benefit. Has anybody ever met a parent who said, gee, I hope my kids grow up to be smokers? What a bizarre thing it would be for a parent to say something like that, given what we now know about smoking. Most people who smoke wish they didn't smoke. Uh, most people who smoke try repeatedly to quit. Uh, it's very difficult to quit. I had a friend who had been a heroin addict. He said it was much easier to quit heroin than it had been to quit smoking. Uh, it's the, one of the most addictive substances known to man, uh, but now we have made progress against it. But we were very reluctant to take the steps we took. We have taxed cigarettes, 
Uh, I bought a pack of camels in 1959 for 25 cents in North Carolina. Now in New York, you can't get one for less than $13. You can't smoke in restaurants and bars and uh, many other buildings. Public spaces are now uh, smoke-free in, in man many jurisdictions. Uh, the Americans don't like to be told that they can't do what they want to do. They don't like taxation. They don't like regulation. How did we take these measures? Well, the regulators invoked the harm pr principle. Uh, I don't know how many of you read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. I read it in the 11th grade. It made a huge impression on me. Mill's uh, harm pr principle said the only legitimate reason you can prevent somebody, as a government, uh, you can prevent somebody from doing what she wants to do is to prevent harm to other people. To protect the person herself, that's not a legitimate reason for the government to tell you you can't do what you want to do. And so what regulators did in the smoking case was they offered the classic externalities justification for taxation and regulation. You can't smoke because that would harm bystanders when you expose them to secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke is a real injury to be sure, but unless you work in a bar, a crowded bar for 10 hours uh, straight, night after night, with no ventilation, the injury from secondhand smoke is minuscule compared to the injury that you suffer from actually being a smoker. It's a very small injury compared to the real injury of being a smoker, which is, is to inhale that stuff 40 times into your lung uh, each day. Uh, and we can argue about whether the government has any legitimate role protecting you from harming yourself. I, I think it's a more complicated issue than Mill made it sound like in his writings. Uh, I, I didn't believe that as a young man, but I believe that now. But the real harm you do if you take up smoking is to make other people more likely to smoke. That, that's the harm to others that you, you cause. And that fits the Mill principle. And some people push back and say, well, it's not the government's job to tell people which behaviors to mimic and which ones to avoid. That's their responsibility. And, and I, I, I like the sentiment that motivates that objection. But think about it. We know that parents, all parents, want their kids to grow up to be healthy, to be non-smokers. Uh, we know statistically, if there are more smokers out there, we don't know which ones, but it's statistically certain that many of them are going to be frustrated and not achieve the goal of raising kids to be non-smokers. And that's an injury, and they have no recourse. What can they do? Can they try harder to persuade their kids not to smoke? That doesn't work. You, you can push a little harder, and that, that helps, but past a certain point, if you push any further, your kid's going to be more likely to smoke, not less likely. So. The, the, the reasons we offered for regulating smoking were spurious. The real reason it makes sense to regulate it is that smoking causes other people to smoke and that causes harm to both them and to the, the people who care about them. Well, we can't be worrying about parents with injured feelings. Well, you don't want parents to care about their kids. Uh, you, would you, the utilitarians say if, if, if you could pull a lever and save two strangers instead of saving your kid, you ought to pull the lever. I don't think I would want to live in a society in which people pulled that lever. I don't think the people who would pull that lever would be able to raise kids I would want to have anything to do with. Uh, <laughs> If you're worried about whether your daughter is going to be a smoker, uh, it doesn't help to know if she's a science fiction buff or if she uh, cares about the Seattle Seahawks or is a, a, a science fiction uh, 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 hater. None of that predicts anything. What you really want to know is the proportion of her friends who smoke. That, that's the, the one piece of information that predicts how much risk she's in. And if that, if that percentage goes from 20 to 30, she becomes 25% more likely to become or remain a smoker. It's a huge effect. And it's an, a very ample reason for taking the regulatory steps that we did take. Behavioral contagion is implicated in a whole variety of other 
problems too. It contributes to problem drinking, to sexual predation. You can look at the Me Too movement, how contagious that was, to cheating, uh, the, the reduction in IRS budgets and the lower enforcement rates, uh, audit rates, have, have now created the impression that other people are cheating on their taxes and getting away with it. Uh, that's the direct effect uh, of, of the relaxed regulations, but the indirect effect is going to be massive compared to that. I'm a chump. If they're cheating and getting away with it, and I'm paying my taxes, I'm a chump. Uh, people are going to uh, really abandon the high tax compliance that we've enjoyed through the decades in the U.S. Bullying is, is socially contagious. Obesity, if the military sends a, a, a family to a county where the obesity rate is 1% higher than where they were, they become 5% more likely to become obese during their stay there. The, the, the two categories that I'm going to focus on, though, uh, for the purpose of people who are concerned about the, the two biggest problems that the country faces, the runaway growth and income inequality and the climate crisis, uh, are these last two. Uh, the, the way we spend our money uh, makes perfectly good sense to us uh, as individuals, but from our collective vantage point, it makes no sense at all. We waste, I estimate, at least uh, several trillion dollars a year in the U.S. alone spending our monies in ways that yield no value to anyone. Uh, the explanation for that is analogous to the behavior that we see in sports events where people stand to see better only to realize that nobody's seeing any better than if everybody had remained comfortably seated. Uh, our spending patterns are subject to a distortion that's exactly analogous to the logic that gives rise to that problem. Uh, and then greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the, the, the reasons uh, uh, for those are also very closely linked to behavioral contagion. So one simple example is the contagion of heavy vehicles. Some people started buying these outsized vehicles uh, in the 1980s. The engineers were puzzled. Why, why do they want these big off-road vehicles? They wondered. Uh, none of them go off-road. The only time they go off-road is when they're drunk on Saturday night and miss their driveway. Uh, they, they don't really need to go off-road, and yet they're all buying these uh, behemoth uh, vehicles that get eight miles per gallon. Uh, but if others bought one and you didn't, then you, you would be at greater risk of injury and death uh, as a result of a collision with one. And so you bought a heavier vehicle just to protect yourself. Others bought heavier, you bought heavier still. We saw a race to these now, uh, uh, these vehicles that now, now weigh seven to 8,000 pounds. Uh, and the end result of that is that the risk of injury and death when everybody drives big vehicles is higher, not lower. You're more likely to get killed if everybody's driving these. If we were to push that process the other way, if we were, say, to tax vehicles by weight, uh, we would see some people say, oh, I guess I don't really need that. And then some would buy lighter vehicles. Others would realize they were less at risk. At risk they would buy lighter vehicles too, and we would see that cascade uh, go off in a reverse direction. The Behavioral contagion operates in both directions always. It can be a force for good. I've been talking about mostly problematic effects of it. Here's Google's Project Sunroof. You notice the houses with red dots in the diagram. Uh, those are houses that have solar panels on the rooftops. Do you see any pattern? What's true is that virtually every house with a red dot on it is contiguous with another house that has one. The ones that don't have red dots are clustered. They're next to people who don't have solar panels. And talking with the solar installer in our area, uh, he will tell you story after story. Oh, I put an installation in on, on Ellis Hollow Road, and then uh, in the next month, there were four installations, bang, 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 right next, next to that one. Uh, the, the step you take doesn't seem significant, but that's because you don't take into account the second round effects. You install one, that causes someone else to install one. They know somebody, they go home for Thanksgiving, they talk about the, the savings they're reaping from heaven, and then others in, install it, and it radiates out from there. 
We know how to get people to do this. If they're not inclined to do it already, we can either tax harmful activities or subsidize beneficial ones. We've been subsidizing the, the installation of solar panels. Some people object to that. They say, oh, that's subsidies for rich people, but it's a very powerful stimulus to the contagion effect that we've been observing. Arthur Pergou says, if somebody is causing harm with ordinary pollution, pollution, the, the, the best response to that is to tax the smoke they emit. Uh, and it's the same with behavioral externalities, as I call them. Uh, if my behavior causes harm to others by making the social environment, we should try to encourage me from doing whatever it is I'm doing to cause that by making it a little bit more expensive for me to do it. So the example of a carbon tax, I think, uh, is one that's uh, a, a sore point here in the Northwest, obviously, but, but I think it's political malpractice that we haven't succeeded in adopting one. What's true is that the worldwide energy use of the top 10% of the income distribution uh, is about half of all total energy usage. So if we had a carbon tax, about uh, half the revenue worldwide, but in this country maybe a little less than that, but still a disproportionate share, would come from the wealthy who, after all, drive heavier vehicles, fly to more distant destinations more often, and have bigger houses, and do everything at a grander scale, and use much more energy. The, the revenue would come from them. Uh, the, the way to get it enacted would be to make it revenue neutral, uh, as I know some of you are already well aware, you'd give the money back. Uh, my own preference would be not to give any of it back to the people at the top of the income ladder because they're going to benefit most from the cleanup anyway. Uh, give it back to middle and low income families, and if you did that, then about 90% of the voters would get a check back every month that was bigger than the amount that they had paid in carbon taxes. How good of a politician would you have to be in order to get people to vote for that? Uh, but we haven't done that. We just say, we say tax and everybody runs for the hills. Uh, oh, I don't like tax. A tax properly implemented would be attractive to at least 90%, and it ought to be attractive to the wealthy who would be net payers under a tax like that. We need to spend trillions of dollars if we're going to decarbonize the economy, and we have to do it quickly because time's running out to do it. Where are we going to get the money to do all that? This is one of the main hurdles to mounting a political movement that can actually tackle the problem. Uh, here I'll try to explain quickly why we're wasting way more than the amount of money we would need to do the necessary investment and how we could easily harvest it to put it to that use. What's happened in the last decades, at least since 1970, is that most of the income gains have gone to the top of the income ladder. That used to be argued about, no more. Uh, the, the income inequality has been growing very rapidly. What do the rich people do with their money? They do what everybody else does with their money. They buy bigger and better. Uh, that's often thought to be a moral failure on their part, but it isn't. Uh, that's just what people do. Poor people do that, middle income people do that too. And so they buy huge mansions, uh, tisk tisk, but in their circle, those houses seem normal. That, that's part of the, the frame of reference. I lived in a two-room house uh, for two years as a Peace Corps volunteer in rural Nepal. Uh, none of you would want to live in a house like that. If, if I lived in one like that in Ithaca, my kids wouldn't have wanted their friends to see where we lived. They would have been ashamed of it. But it was a perfectly normal house there. If my friends in Nepal saw my house in Ithaca, they would think, oh, what, why would anybody need such a grand palace as that? Why so many bathrooms? Uh, but, but you wouldn't think that. You would think, all right, a professor, senior professor lives in a house like that. That's, that's normal. So they, they build bigger. The people in the middle aren't angry about that. They, all, they want to see pictures of, of the mansions and the, and the yachts. They, I'm going to be rich someday, or my kids will be. They, they won't, probably, but, but they, they, they like the pictures. What's true, though, is the people just below the top socialize with the people at the top. Maybe it's now the, the custom to have your daughter's wedding reception at home. Uh, we need to build bigger uh, because that's the We need a ballroom. And then the people just below them socialize with them. We need 
a dining room to serve 18, not 12. Uh, that's now, now the custom. And so it cascades all the way down the income ladder without reference to that cascade. The people in the middle don't have any more money now than before. You can't explain why the median new house has grown so explosively over these decades. It's because of behavioral contagion. And look at all the energy that goes into building those bigger houses, heating them, maintaining them, all, all those things. is just energy completely out the window. If there's one reliable finding in the voluminous and contentious literature on the determinants of human well-being, it's this. Once the mansions reach a certain point, uh, uh, one that we've long since passed, but just imagine 10,000 square feet, if they grow 50% bigger, nobody gets any happier because of that. It just r raises the bar that defines adequate for, for people in their own minds. What do they need? I think if we knew the answer, nobody has done the experiment, obviously, but if we knew the answer, if it were in an envelope, I'd be willing to bet my entire retirement account that the people with the 15,000 square foot houses would be less happy than the ones living in 10,000 square foot ha houses because it's just so much more hassle to manage the bigger property. If the only reason you need it is that other people have it, it's just better not to have it. Uh, so that's pure waste. So we, we might tell the middle income family, well, don't buy it if you can't afford it. They can't afford it. They've had to work every uh, margin to be able to meet, meet their Mortgage payments, uh, they live farther from town. That means longer commutes, land's cheaper out there. That's more energy pumped into the... Uh, buy a cheaper house. Well, if you buy a cheaper house, uh, here's the consequence. In addition to having a smaller one, you can live with that. But every jurisdiction has better schools in more expensive neighborhoods. I've lived in many countries for, for various periods of time. That's true every place I've ever been. Nobody's ever told me about a place where it's different. And if you're the median earner and your ambition is just to send your kid to a school of average quality, think about that. If you had any lower ambition than that, we would think ill of you as a parent. So I'm, I'm the average earner. I want to send my kid to an average quality school what must I do? I must gain access to the median price house in my area. And if the people in the top are building bigger and the people below them are building bigger and so on, all the way down to the people in my slice of the income distribution, if they're all building bigger, I've got to build bigger or else my kids are going to go to the schools with the metal detectors out front. And I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's a bad choice. I don't want to make that choice, but I'm not going to do that. And so they go into debt. Uh, they, they take every step. So let me give you a thought experiment just to flesh this argument out a little bit. Uh, I like cars. If you don't like cars, uh, be patient with the example. You, you'll be able to figure out the, the, the gist of it. I'm imagining two separate worlds. A low-tax world, think of that as the U.S., and then a high-tax world, maybe Norway or Sweden. In the low-tax world, the rich have lots of disposable income, and their vehicle of choice is the Ferrari F12 Berlinetta. It's a great car, a uh, third of a million dollars. Uh, the, 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 the poor rich in the high-tax world can't afford that car. It's not even on offer there. Uh, they're forced to make do with the lowly Porsche 911 Turbo, $150,000. Now, the question is, if the two worlds were exactly alike, except for the different cars that the rich people drove, would there be any difference in happiness levels of the rich people in the two countries? Uh, nobody's done the experiment, so we can't say for sure, but all the evidence we have says no. Why? Because every feature that affects handling and performance is already present in the Porsche by the time you get up to a car that good. There's not much more you can do to make a car better. So if there's a difference between the two cars, and some people actually argue that the Porsche is a better car 
in absolute. If there's a difference, it's a teeny difference. And because you're in a local environment and others are driving the best car just like you, uh, you don't feel envious that you're not driving the better car. Uh, and so the prediction would be, well, there'd be no measurable difference in happiness between the rich drivers in these two countries. But of course, conditions in the two worlds wouldn't be the same in all other respects. Why? Because the world on the right has more tax revenue. Now, take whatever attitude you will about how wasteful the government is. Uh, oh, they build bridges to nowhere. Oh, there's fraud and abuse. Uh, yeah, all right, we can find examples of that. But there's waste in the private sector too. How about houses bigger than we need or actually uh, b bigger than would be good for all of us if we, if we could agree collectively to sit down and not buy houses that big. Uh, the, the high tax world has more revenue to spend on public services. At least some of that money is going to go into better road maintenance. And so the question then really is who's happier? <laughs> Somebody who drives a Ferrari on uh, pothole riddle roads or somebody who drives the Porsche on well-maintained roads. That's not even an interesting question. <laughs> who, who, would choose, who would choose the first one? What a, what, a, what, a, what a ridiculous notion that anybody would think that the first situation would be better. Okay, so that's... that's uh, sort of my proof by example that if we spent our money differently, we could lead uh, happier, more healthful, and more satisfying lives and invest money in, in, in decarbonizing the energy system and so on. But then uh, there's a very important question raised by that claim, and it's one that I wish I had tackled earlier in my career. Uh, I regret that I didn't have the wit to do that. Uh, but I'm thinking about it now, and I have a hypothesis. The question is, if people uh, would be happier if they spent their money in different ways, less on private consumption, more on public investment, why don't they elect politicians who will enact that program? This is a version of the, if I'm so smart, how come I'm not rich question. Uh, I've been claiming that that would make people happy. Why don't we vote for people uh, then who would propose to do that? My tentative answer, my hypothesis is that because people suffer from what I'm calling the mother of all cognitive illusions. They think higher taxes would make it harder for them to buy what they want but they're wrong about that. That's the mother of all cognitive illusions. Let me say a little bit about cognitive illusions generally. Here's one. Well, I've, maybe I've given away uh, the secret. Which square is darker? Square A or square B? They're the same. They're the same. Somebody thinks they're the same. Does anybody else think they're different? B is darker. <laughs> I was shown this, I was shown, this is called the, the checker shadow illusion. I was shown it and I said uh, in response to the question, square A is darker. I, I felt very confident about that and my interlocutor said, no, they're the same color. They're exactly the same shade of gray and I thought about it and I said, no. That, <laughs> <laughs> that can't be right. Here's what the psychologists say about this. They say, we look at the image, uh, the light coming from A and B reaches the eye and gets sent into the brain, telling it that it's the same shade of gray, but the brain also knows that B lies in shadow. And so the brain knows, even though it's not consciously aware of this perhaps, the brain knows that B looks darker than it really is. And so the brain automatically compensates for that knowledge by making it appear lighter to you so you will be more nearly accurate in your assessment about what's really happening in the world. That's a really 
very cogent explanation to my ear. I, I, I thought, yeah, that makes perfectly sense, per perfectly good sense. And then I look at the diagram again, and I said, but no, that can't be, that can't be right. They're just not the same color. I, I couldn't believe that they were until I saw this version of the diagram. I've, I've here joined the two squares by a strip that is exactly the same shade of gray uh, all along it, and as you can see clearly, there is absolutely no contrast between the strip I've added and the squares A and B. They are the exact same shade of gray. Uh, if, if you think they looked like they were the exact same shade of gray, you ought to schedule an appointment with your neurologist. Uh, the normally functioning human brain ought to have been telling you that A was darker. So my point in showing you this example is, is that it's possible to believe something has to be true. I believed A and B have to be different shades of gray and yet be wrong about what you believe. It's a humbling experience. For me it was uh, to confront this illusion. Uh, my wife said, that's good. You need more experiences like that. Uh, <laughs> savor that one. Uh, so it might be possible that rich people believe something that has to be true, but it isn't true. And let me explain why I think that is exactly what's happening. So you're a rich person, you want to know how higher taxes will affect you. The, the normal cognitive drill that we would run through to think about a question like that would be, well, all right, I'll think back to the last time they raised my taxes, how did I feel about that? We, we're thinking about going to Disneyland. Uh, how did we feel the last time we went to a, a, a theme park? Was it fun? Uh, we, we think about these sorts of things in that way. The problem here is that if you're alive today, this cognitive strategy doesn't work. In 1966, that's the year I graduated from Georgia Tech, the top marginal tax rate was 70%. In World War II, it had been 92%. By 82, it had fallen to 50%. That's the first Reagan uh, uh, move. 87, it was down to 38%. Uh, it's now 37%. There were a couple of little inches upward, but too small to notice or remember. So you can't think about the effect of how higher taxes would, would, would make you feel by thinking back to episodes like that because there haven't been any, essentially. So you go to cognitive plan B. What's that? Plan B is, well, I know that if they raise my taxes, I'll have less money. That's true. That's incontrovertibly true. I'll have less money, and so I'll think about the times when I had less money. How did I feel? There, there are, no matter how charmed a life you've led, there are times like that in virtually every life history. So uh, higher taxes, that means I got less money. How did I feel about that when that happened to me? Well. I had a bad business year, I had less money, that felt horrible. I had a divorce, I had less money, that felt horrible. I had a house fire, that felt horrible. I had a health crisis, maybe my kid got arrested, I had to hire a lawyer uh, to get him out of jail and defend him, that felt horrible. Uh, to bid for the things you want, none of those things is at all like the effect of a tax increase. If you have a bad business year, you have less money, the people like you have the same amount of money they used to have. The things you want, nobody is worried that a tax bill is going to threaten your ability to buy what anybody might reasonably be said to need. Of course that's not going to, it's going to keep me from buying what I want. Well, what I want are life's special extras, the things that you, you, you don't have enough of that you have to compete with other people to get, and the way you get them is to outbid other people like you who want them. And when your taxes go up, and the people like you have taxes go up too, your relative bidding power remains exactly the same as before. And so if you're in New York and you want that apartment, there's only one of them with that view, who's going to get it? The high bidder's going to get it. And the high bidder is going to be the same person whether the tax rate is here or here. But if I met a person who thought about it that way, I would think I'd met a person from another planet. That's just, a, that's like a person who would look at the checkerboard and say, oh yeah, those, those two are the same shade of gray. Uh, 
that's just not the natural way to think about it. Uh, less money, of course, that's going to make me feel bad. But it's a false belief. Okay, just a, a couple more quick points I wanted to hit, and then we'll go to questions. Uh, there, this has been a contentious point uh, in the climate community, whether personal action is something that, that matters. Uh, should I buy a Prius uh, to save the planet? Uh, economists and climate uh, activists say, uh, if you think you're making a difference by doing that, you're not thinking about it correctly. If you buy a Prius and nobody else does, the climate's not going anywhere. It's going to be the same problem as before. If you don't buy a Prius and everybody else does, well, then that'll help, but it'll help uh, despite your participation. In the only way we're going to solve this problem is if we have robust policies that result in massive investment in decarbonization and car stiff carbon taxes and things like that. So they say uh, these are placebos, these steps that individuals take. Uh, I used to share that view, and I've retreated from it as a result of working on the material I had to, to study for this book. Let me, let me tell you what that uh, view of the process misses, I think. If you take an action like this, it affects the amount you'll emit, that's true, but it also changes the probability that others will take a similar action. We know that from the solar panels research. And this is another vivid example of contagion. The Prius had a unique shape. If you had that in your driveway, people knew you had a hybrid. The Civic had a hybrid, but it looked just like the, the non-hybrid Civic, and it didn't sell worth a damn. Nobody copied anybody driving a Honda Civic hybrid. This was the one that took off uh, because people want to be doing the right thing. If they see others do the right thing, they're more likely to want it. So that's one effect. But I think an even more important effect in, in my way of thinking about it is that when you take individual steps, when you don't buy plastic straws, when you take a cloth bag to the supermarket, when you, you bike instead of drive, uh, when, when you eat a little bit less meat during the week, when you do those things, that changes who you are. It, 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 we, we don't come into the world with a fixed identity, we acquire an identity. Uh, Aristotle uh, talked about the importance of habit. We, we, we are what we repeatedly do. Uh, and so when you do these things, you become a climate person, uh, somebody who cares about the planet. That's your identity. And Someone with that identity is more likely to vote for a candidate who will enact the policies that the climate community and the economists say uh, that without which we won't be able to, to solve this problem. You're more likely to write checks to their campaign committees. You're more likely to knock on doors to help them get elected. So, so I, I think taking individual steps uh, uh, is a good thing to do. I'm, I'm, I'm much more for that. I'm doing much more of that myself than I used to when I was skeptical about the appeal of, of doing that. Be aware that small beginnings often produce huge... Uh, this is Greta Thunberg uh, at about age 13 or 14. She was already launching her crusade then to save the planet, uh, I'm guessing that she hoped that her efforts would make a big difference, uh, but I guess also that she really didn't imagine that they would make a big difference. Uh, but they have made an enormous difference. Uh, there are young people uh, in the streets all over the world hammering uh, the, the, the people in our age group to do something about this. Uh, and I think in time, they will have an impact on what we choose to do about this. I was uh, hopeful uh, about each of the books I've written in the past that they would make a difference. Uh, uh, I think I knew too to expect uh, that they wouldn't make much of a difference, and indeed they didn't make much of a difference. But uh, if I hadn't written those books, I don't think I would have been able to write the current book. And I'm hoping even more strongly than with any of the earlier books that this book will make a difference just because the stakes are so much higher now. Uh, probably it won't make a difference, but I'm, I'm not sorry that I wrote it. Uh, 
uh, it will help me do the next step in, in trying to make a difference on, on, this, on this issue. Uh, the <laughs> Sam, Samuel Johnson said, it is within the power of every man to do nothing. Uh, <laughs> But we can also act. Uh, and if the choice is between hope and de despair, why choose despair? You know, what, what, what's, the, what's the upside to that posture? Get, get involved. Do, do something. Pitch in. Uh, the, the climate activist, uh, Catherine Wilkinson, I heard give a talk. Uh, it was a magnificent. And she ended it with, 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 uh, with this magnificent uh, sentence. She said, it's a magnificent time to be alive in a moment that matters so much. Uh, so, so get involved and do something uh, and, and make something happen. Even a small thing can spark a contagion that can blow up more than you ever imagined that it could. Uh, I'm trying to spread information about these ideas uh, in, in my newly formed Twitter account. Uh, I've got a, a very modest following. If any of you is on Twitter, I look at this crowd and I'm guessing not many of you are, are on, on Twitter. Well, I wasn't either, but uh, that's what you have to do now if you want to. If you wanna, uh, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, go on there. You can find stuff I'm writing about. And, and I want to say uh, that Seattle, unlike Ithaca, has a really big menu of things that you could be doing uh, each and every night. And so I'm really grateful that you took time out to come and hear me talk about the book. And I'm happy to take questions for as long a time as we have. Uh, you talked a lot about the uh, pressure of friends and neighbors on, on how we act, but um, you didn't mention the power of advertising, and I think of the whole cigarette craze and yes. pulling people into that, of like the picture of sophistication and beauty of smoking. And yes, that, that's, you know, there are many forces that act upon us, and it's not just our peers, that, and, and, you know, Tom Steyer got in the last debate. Uh, there were several really good candidates who didn't get in the last debate, and the difference was the amount of money he had available to spend on advertising. Uh, if I were Tom Steyer, I would pay the fines of the felons in Florida who are not going to be able to vote unless those fines are paid. Uh, if I were Tom Steyer, I, I would hire... Pixar to make an animated video that would explain to ordinary people the mother of all cognitive illusions and why if we taxed the wealthiest people more heavily, they wouldn't have to make any sacrifices at all, which I think would boost the number of people who would vote for candidates who would be comfortable with, with proposals to do exactly that. Yeah, the, the, yeah we've got Michael Bloomberg, uh, spending even more money than Tom Steyer. I've, I've uh, actually suggested that he pay the fines of the felons too. Uh, we, we could deploy those same wef weapons on behalf of, of the, the cause that we care about. Uh, yeah, th those are weapons for sure. They have an effect. What did he say? <laughs> I'm not in direct contact with him. I, I, somebody uh, had a tweet saying that Governor DeSantis in Florida <laughs> thought that they shouldn't be allowed to vote unless they paid their fines. And I, and I responded to that tweet by saying, uh, how about if uh, Mike Bloomberg pays the fines, wouldn't he have a more certain impact on November 2020 doing that than whatever else he might do? I think she's up next. Hi. Uh, the TED organization is doing a project called Countdown. They're trying to get worldwide action for big things on climate change. And uh, as part of that, I'm working on a personal project uh, to, to um, develop a, a website and an app where people can make commitments to yes. things that they want to, that they are willing to, changes that they're willing to make uh, so that people can see what would be the carbon impact, but more importantly, what would, what's the aggregate of the impact for 
all the people who are doing that, or uh -huh. all the people in their neighborhood, or their city, or their yeah, you know, their yeah. Company. To see a bigger number would be motivating, wouldn't it? Uh, well, that's my hope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to find out if do you know of anyone, any other uh, individual or person who's working on a project like that? Uh, I do not. Like, okay. No, I'm sorry, I don't. Uh, I I will. Yeah. Later on, I'll okay. come up and ask you, how, okay. how do you give a TED Talk? That would be a way to get more people to know about some of these ideas. I'm, I'm Happy to talk about that. <laughs> I have two things. One is to congratulate you. Uh, they make this brochure here with all the stuff for the month, and then they pick one guy who's, who they give the back page to. And I actually asked them out front, do you guys put this up for each speaker? And they said, no, this is the only one this month. So you got the whole month. Good stuff. Congratulations. <laughs> In any event, I came here, my, my real question is, I came here because uh, I was hoping you would tell us how to save the planet. And instead, I've heard you talk about social contagion, which is appropriate, and about smoking and fancy cars. And I'm wondering if you have extrapolated that out to <coughs> experiments of actually saving the planet and how, that, how that we're going to implement that. Uh, the, the and I'm hoping you have. The contribution I'm trying to make is to explain where we can get the money to make the investments we need to make to decarbonize the economy. If you want to hear an interesting discussion, uh, Ezra Klein, who is one of the founding uh, editors of Vox.com, has a podcast. He interviewed Saul Griffiths a couple of weeks ago, who knows more about the con concrete steps we need to take to get the carbon level down to zero than anybody on the planet. He's, a, he's an engineering genius. And it's, it's a massive series of steps that we need to take. It's, it's truly on the order of the mobilization that we saw during World War II. But we did that then, and we could do that again now, but it's going to cost an enormous amount of money. And I see my contribution as, as being trying to explain to people why uh, the, the things we would need to do to come up with that money wouldn't be anywhere near as painful as people imagine. So that's one contribution. The other is that enacting the policies that we already know would make a difference in our emissions levels will have not just the direct effects of those policy impacts, which are small, but will have many fold the size of those impacts as the effects radiate out through social contagion. So, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not gonna apologize for not saving the planet tonight, but, <laughs> but uh, that, if I'm right about those two things, then I think that those are important steps toward helping to save the planet, that's why I'm uh, I'm investing all the en energy I can muster to help get these items under discussion. So we need to, to empower Saul Griffin to do these things for all the things that he's come up with, if that's the right name. He, he needs to tell us how to spend the money that I'm telling you how to raise. Uh, my question is, how do we as consumers and community members have an influence to decrease spending on like big oil? A, a carbon tax would be uh, job number one to get to accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels to renewable fuels. You know, I think uh, the, the trick is for airplanes and mobile vehicles to get uh, a source of energy that doesn't pollute. For land vehicles, electricity is, is the obvious solution. Uh, you're not going to be able to run an airplane across the Atlantic on electricity, or at least it doesn't look like we're going to be able to do that anytime soon. But there are new developments now uh, whereby we can generate a hydrogen-based fuel using solar power that would be volatile enough to, uh, to, in a small volume, get an airplane across the Atlantic. So, yeah, we, we have ways forward on, on, on both of those. Good question. Hi there. Um, thank you for your talk tonight. Definitely made me think of a lot of questions. Um, so one of them is uh, I am currently, I work at a 
a retail company that does a lot for its employees to encourage behavior change um, more than most, definitely. Yes. Um, but they only pay most of the people just like a touch above minimum wage. Um, I'm curious how, like if you could speak to like the power of like the, the social workplace and sort of maybe how to kindly talk to your employer while you work for them and maybe after, yeah. <laughs> or you know, how to yeah, enact that pressure. I mean, mean, the kind of employer you're working for doesn't have a lot of money to pay high wages, obviously. They, they do, though. Oh, they do, oh, well. <laughs> shame, shame on them if they're not. If, yeah, I've done, yeah, I've done well, my research. Uh, I've done my research. And, and whatever you can make happen there, uh, an equally important set of steps to take is to to build a social safety net like the sa safety nets that most other countries have. Here, uh, you know, if you get sick, you go bankrupt. Uh, that's n not something that can happen in, in Northern Europe. They, they, they just don't uh, have that. The, the, the crushing burden of student debt, uh, all those things would make living on a modest wage a, a little bit more bearable than it is under the current system. So I think that's been something I've been lobbying for uh, and, and you know, writing campaign donations on the basis of, but, but yeah, I think you know, whatever, you know, the, the, the campaign for a $15 minimum wage has made a lot of head, headway starting here in Seattle, uh, interestingly. Uh, and I think uh, if we could have a, a, uh, an expanded version of the earned income tax, that, that would be even better than the minimum wage, I think. But, you know, we've got, you know, job one is to elect different people in Washington. Uh, we're, we're, we're stymied. We can't do anything that we need to do because of the people who are in power now. You've got to change the people in those seats before we're going to actually make any progress. I spent a total of a year in Nepal, but I have stopped flying. My question to you is, did you learn any of these, of your, of your content of your book in Nepal? Did I learn any of the content of my book in Nepal? I would say, uh, yes, exclamation point. Uh, I, I think I mentioned the example of the house I lived in there. And, and, and how modest it was by our standards. I think uh, if, if anybody here who had lived here uh, her whole life heard me say that, they would say, yeah, I get that. Uh, of course, the frame of reference matters. But I think uh, there's a difference between knowing something and knowing it with a capital K. I feel like the fact of living in that environment for two years, it was then the poorest country that they had records uh, for, uh, I experienced the fact that the hum human drama played out in essentially the same way there as it does other places where I'd lived, even though the, the material standard was vastly lower there. And I think uh, that has colored what I've written in the decades since I've been back from Nepal. I came back in 1968 and I've been writing about this sort of thing ever since then. So yes is the answer. Uh, my first time there was in 1970. Thank you. I just wanted you to know I did try and use some peer pressure to get some of my friends to come here tonight. So, um, <laughs> but, so you mentioned peer pressure in a lot of ways that where people are seeing things. They're seeing people with cars. They're seeing people with so, uh, the solar panels. They're seeing people smoke. How can we best utilize social media as a tool to exert additional pressure slash galvanization slash encouragement to effect change? We, we know it matters. You know, what people see on social media does affect what they do. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's something where you can uh, imagine if, if you're uh, sensitized to the fact that there are these radiating effects. You can weigh what you say and do on social media with that in mind. Uh, we, uh, I said that most people don't think when they're considering whether to be a smoker, oh, I shouldn't do that, I'll make others more likely to smoke, but why shouldn't you think about that? Uh, you, you have 
actually much more impact on other people because of social media. And, and if you want to say, I'm living a morally responsible life, then you should think about that, I think. How will what I do affect what they do? Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. So, um, I, yeah, just I'll get this out of the way. I'm Australian. I have an accent. It's not South African. <laughs> it's not Canadian. I'm Australian. And I, ironically, I guess, the fires that are happening there right now, um, I've, I've just finished a Master's of Global Development and it kicked me in the ass in many ways and said, okay, stop having self-pity, do something about it. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest things I think that your what your book is about, what you've talked about, the, the most powerful thing is that you're essentially showing people that what you do as an individual makes a difference, which is one of the biggest reasons that people say, oh, well, what does it matter? Yeah. Why does it yeah. matter, right? Throwing their hands up in the air. The intersection of that with taxation um, is it, obviously that scares people off, but that's the, that's the, the bigger answer from what I'm understanding uh -huh. for you, like a voting, you, you need to vote, you need to tax. But then there's the one piece that sort of seems to be missing is the what is there stuff out there right now that can happen? Um, I 2040 is a movie by an Australian who, which is about the positive is the thing that you said at the start, the positive things that can happen that we already have the tools and the things mm -hmm. that we need right now. We know what we need to do. We just need to do it. So I guess like with that is the, my understanding and a, a really impressive takeaway for me because I can take your book to these, the, the events that I'm running um, to talk about how actually, yes, exactly yeah. what you think and what you do does matter. I want to know um, from your talks and from your book, after people read it and after people leave here, either what is the question that you want people to be walking away from or what is the action that you want people to take after they do, that they see you talk and they hear your story? So you're, you're trying to change people's minds about the path forward, I take it? And Not necessarily. I'm trying to um, attach, like connect individual lived experience mm -hmm. our every our everyday lives which is all we have yeah with the fact that global these global challenges exist and continue to exist because of group decisions like our collective decision making right so the the last chapter in the book uh i try to take up the 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 question of how we could speak effectively with people to get them to to consider other ways of doing things uh and and in a, in a polarized era, that's very difficult to do. Uh, whenever Al Gore would talk about a new piece of climate news that was worse than what people had seen so far, the people who were denying that climate change was a, a, a problem became even more firmly wedded to their denial when they would hear him say something about it. So it's a very big challenge. Uh, what, what the research on this subject uh, indicates, and it's very interesting, is that you, you make very little progress telling people what to do or believe. If you can ask the right question, though, uh, you can get people to think about things in a new way. Uh, and and I'm, I'm working now trying to think of what are the right questions we need to ask to move the ball forward uh, in the way you're trying to. And I don't have a lot of good uh, things to report back to you yet, but I'll, I'll give you an example of how powerful this approach is from another domain, which was in the battle over the Affordable Care Act, uh, the Obamacare mandate. It was very controversial. The, the, the right was very firmly opposed to it. They voted scores of times in the House to repeal it. The, the mandate, the, the requirement that you buy insurance that the government would fine you if you didn't buy insurance was the thing that made people most angry of any feature of the act. Uh, and you could try to explain to them why uh, in an insurance market you had to have uh, a feature like that or the pool would unravel and so but nobody would listen, you couldn't make any progress with that. But I stumbled onto a question that seemed to help and the question was this, what do you think would happen if the government required home insurers to sell fire insurance to people at affordable rates after their houses had already burned down. People didn't seem to get defensive when they would hear that, oh, that's interesting, well, you know, that'd be kind of dumb that the government would, 
But what would happen? Uh, and very quickly, they would report that if the government did that, nobody would buy fire insurance until his house had already burned down. Why would you, why would you buy it beforehand? You probably don't need it. Buy it only if you need it. Uh, and then it's just a tiny step from that to the realization that the guy with the pre-existing medical condition is exactly the guy whose house is already burned down. And if you don't have everybody else in the pool, you can't get insurance for that person. So, so you help with this. Uh, think of questions that you might ask people that would let them discover on their own that, hey, we could do this and it might, it, it might help matters. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about that, and I wish I had more good things to tell you in that domain, but I don't. No, thank you for but <laughs> the attempt <laughs> on, the, on the spot. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate that, and I, I think that it, it is more about leading people to the water and like showing them it's there. Yeah. Yeah, and this this is um a, that is the biggest thing. Having an economist say I didn't believe that you know doing an individual act like you know, taking an environmentally conscientious act, you know, that was yeah. so small was meaningful. And you saying that as an economist is what probably the biggest effect you're going to have with this book. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we only have time for one or two more questions if they're very brief. Good evening. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about how large these circles or waves of peer influence are, because I was thinking about your question, your statement about getting elected officials. We here in Seattle already have a very progressive city council, and yet we have not influenced the entire state, and our state is fairly progressive compared yeah, to yeah. Mississippi, Alabama. So how big a circle are we talking yeah, about? It, yeah, uh, it, the, the one thing you learn when you study contagion is that nothing is predictable. Things can go along without chains for, I mean, for decades. Uh, Nobody predicted that the Soviet Union would dissolve. There were a couple of cranks who predicted it every year, but, but, but aside from that, nobody saw the dissolution of the former Soviet Union happening all within the space of a year in 1989 or, or, or thereabouts. It, it was just not on anybody's radar screen, but that's because these kinds of contagion processes are completely chaotic. Something happens that changes the, the, the person next to him, and if the, if the conditions are right, that will change the next guy, and you'll get a, a, a row of dominoes all fall. But it, it, it may not happen for another 10 years. It's very difficult to predict. But I, I like this, this picture of, of Greta Thunberg. I, I, I go back to this again and again. You know, she... she She's a small person. She's she's on the autism spectrum. She's she's uh, not somebody who central casting would have said is going to change the world in any meaningful way. But look, you know, look. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'll try to make it short. Um, how how is it? How can we get people, large numbers of people, particularly? in the industrialized West and most particularly in the United States where the brainwashing is so intense to recognize that we are in a state of emergency. When the bombs fell at Pearl Harbor, when we had 40% unemployed during the depression, it wasn't that, and you had the dust bowl with thousands, of, it wasn't that hard to see yeah. that it was an emergency. We have, according to both the book that you cited and the work of Jem Bell, Jem Bendel, we have less than 15 years before the entire structure of our society and civilization collapses. Uh, it, it's not 50 years away, it's not yeah. 30 years away, and yet people are in a fog, and we can't seem to motivate enough people. Hong Kong has seven million people. A million and a half people were in the streets for three months to resist the Chinese government in Beijing and were relatively successful. Now, of course, the repression is coming even harder, but they're not giving up. We're lucky if we can get five or 10,000 people to go to a rally here, you know, at Cal Anderson Park. How do we wake people out of the stupor before it's too late? Yeah, it's a great question, and I don't have a clear answer to it. We know that the, the, the people in Australia had a carbon tax, then they voted for people who got rid of the carbon tax, and the, the leaders now are still saying that there's no climate change, it's all an illusion. But maybe a crisis like that is what breaks the, the glass and, and sounds the alarm. Uh, I, th I think we're seeing those kinds of disasters on that scale, and 
uh, my own sense is that more people are beginning to be viscerally aware that there is an emergency. Uh, I think it's. I think we're coming. We have to act in mass. Yeah, we do. No, I'm. I'm. I'm trying to 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 push that. Since time is short, I'm just going to make a statement. Um, that that tax you were talking about is the sole issue of the citizens' climate lobby. So of taxing carbon and giving a dividend. I'm like, yes. oh, that sounds familiar. I just went to a meeting on Tuesday. Um, so if you're interested in doing more, you can join Citizens Climate Lobby. So thank, thank you all again. The, the good people uh, with books were optimistic. They, they brought way more books than I imagined could be sold at an event like this, but maybe people will surprise me. I don't know. Yeah, and Robert <laughs> will be over here signing them as well. Yeah. Thank you so much.